Hello, nice guy. How are you? I'm doing real nice. Nice. Nice to see you again. Excellent. Nice to see you too. Harris, so, yes. What do we discuss today? What we discuss every time we get together, reliability. Yeah, of it's course. all we ever talk, it's all we ever talk about. Exactly. So, and that's all we ever talk about in our work. And when we're not working, it seems like that's what we talk about too. And we talk about reliability in every industry that we that we participate in and every asset type that those industries have. That's exactly. and it's a great thing to talk about. Always. I think the only time I don't really think about reliability is when I'm maybe taking a lunch break, when I got my food in front of me and it's like, okay, I can flush my brain free and I can think about, I'm going to enjoy my lunch. Because you know, I love to eat. Yeah, I know. Well, well if, you look, if you look at me much, much closer, you will see that I like to eat as well. You must have a Croatian camera because it's taking off 20 pounds. Yeah, it's a very, very special kind of camera. It cost me a fortune. <laughs> I'll tell you what, man. Lately, yeah. I've been watching the news and, and the news isn't good. And Unfortunately. It's making me think that sometimes when I'm eating my lunch, that I should even start thinking about reliability too. Agree. So I'm going to start off our discussion today, my friend, with a really hard question. And I know you can answer it. Here's the question. Can we eat reliability since we're talking about lunch? <laughs> yeah, it's a very, very direct question, but an excellent one. And uh, we can, we can eat reliability. And as a matter of fact, we do. We do eat it on a daily basis. But before I even answer, let me ask you a question. I'll answer your question with a question and then I'll continue. Uh, okay. When you look at a slice of bread, a piece of steak on your plate in your home, tell me. Yep. What stands between the acre of arable land and your kitchen? Huh. So I ask you a tough question and you come back with an even tougher one. That's exactly how I do it. That's the game we play. Well, you know, first of all, you know, I'm a person who's deeply grateful for everything that comes my way. Everything I have in life, whether it's my family, my business, my toys, and my lunch, I'm deeply grateful. Same here. I know, but I'm also a person just like you that's deeply involved in industry and, and deeply in manu involved in manufacturing. And so I understand, I don't always think about it, but I'm going to do a lot more now. I, I don't always think about what's at stake to get that steak on my plate. And we really need to. Um, so think about it. Uh, I live in a, I live in the countryside. I look out my window right here in in uh, in, in, uh, in my uh, conference room, and I see a cornfield. So all year long, I get to watch that field get cultivated, get planted. I watch them come and spray it with uh, with, with uh, pesticides to keep the to keep the crop pure. I see them fertilizing the crop. I see the combines come in the fall time and, and take the crop off. And then they start it all again. And every one of those machines, every one of those processes depends on reliability. So those are the things I see that get that food from the field into my plate. But there's stuff, there's also stuff. I mean, there's transportation, right? There's silos to store it. There's transportations to move it. Refrigeration trucks to keep my Mexican avocados nice and fresh when they go from Mexico up to Canada. Um, because I mean, we, we can only grow things for a few months a year here. So we depend heavily on, on how that food's going to get from, from the warmer climates to us. And don't forget about the seed companies too. I mean, the seed companies, they have heavy machinery. So there's so much irrigation. I mean, there's so much that goes mm -hmm. in to getting that lunch in front of me. The grocery store, every segment, every step of the, of the journey, reliability has to be involved in some way. Excellent. So I'm, I, I really like it when you answer your own question, but let me expand it <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> well, that was the intention. So well, basically, when you see this way in figurative sense, we do eat reliability. Well, at least a certain percentage of us. 
Uh, you mentioned uh, mentioned uh, watching the news now. Considering the post pandemic reality and uh, and supply chain issues, combine it with the current geopolitical situation, the famine is yep. reality. The famine is not something that we hear on the news and then tomorrow morning everybody forgets about it. By Monday, it's gone. No, it's not gone. It's becoming reality, and we are facing it. We are facing three billion people are facing famine. So more and more people su suffer from food shortages. So that means to me that producing, processing, and transporting more food at a lower cost is critical. Not to discuss here the quality of the food. That's a completely different topic. But mm. when I look at the bottle of milk, I see the bearing that didn't fail. When I look at the peanut butter, I see a very reliable gearbox. So what do you see? So actually, let me expand the question again so you will answer your own question again. What do you see when you see a lunch? And also very important and maybe critically important. What do you see when you see food prices in your local grocery store? Well, food prices should be scaring us to death because everything's going higher and higher and higher. And that's just, that's just the way capitalism works, right? Capital, I always say capitalism works very well for the capitalists, but at the end of the day, who pays? The consumer. Everything filters its way down to the last link of the chain, the people that have to buy it. And, and so I see, I, mean, I see supply chain issues, as you say, and I see um, you know, the, the issues, the, the conflicts that we see in, in Eastern Russia uh, or in Eastern Europe. These, these things are, are problems that we can't control, but reliability is something that can be controlled. And, and maybe that's something that we can look at To What do you think? Is there something that we can do about these crazy prices? Well, we can always do some, some, something with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with these prices, because as, as you mentioned in the capitalism with a, with a, with a capital C, uh, mm -hmm. whatever happens in production, whatever happens with profit, the, the end consumer is paying for that. So obviously, obviously, uh, we don't talk about reliability just as, as a condition monitoring people and reliability people. We talk about reliability as a consumers. So, but do the, peop but do the people in those, but do the, the people in those organizations in, in these companies that are bringing us the food, do they understand that reliability can be impacted on little stupid things like, like a failed steam trap or, or a compressed air leak or, you know, there's more, there's more. Is there ways that they could expand what they do now to lower their costs so that we don't have to pay so much? Well, they should. They should. And if they don't understand by, by themselves, there should be some, somebody explaining it. Because reliability of the growing processing and transporting, uh, sooner or later, it will result in a product scarcity and, and or high production cost impacting end user price. And when we talk about high production costs, the people who make decisions should be thinking about that. So not to mention that scarcity itself increases the price disregarding production costs. Mm -hmm. so, so when you see with it, I, I will let you conclude the answer we started with because it's there. So I guess I get to answer my own question then. Yes, the we do eat part. reliability. <laughs> we do eat reliability <laughs> and we eat it. We could eat it every day, but um, as you said, 3 billion people are going hungry and, and reliability is the difference, could be the difference between whether or not those people go hungry or they actually get fed. And I mean, some of these forces of nature that we just can't control, but this is one of them that we can control. And you, you asked the question, well, who can tell them? I mean, we can tell them. We yes. tell them every day, right? That's what we do. But we have to take it back to the basics. And the basics is, I'm going to be having a nice plate of lunch in about an hour and a half. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to take it for granted. Are you? Definitely not. So we, 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 we fall in the same category of people from that perspective, absolutely. But uh, now let's move it to the reliability. Uh, when, when we say not taking for granted, Mm -hmm. How does that translate in reliability, condition monitoring, and all the technologies used and all the culture used? How does it translate to what we actually do and need to do? Well, and so when I say not taking it for granted, what I'm meaning is that it should motivate us. It should motivate us to look for deeper ways in which we can improve reliability 
and 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 how we should and how that food actually gets to our table um and then if we look at it deep enough then we can find steps along the way we can find links in the chain where we can make improvements yeah okay so again i cannot resist uh, asking a question this can be this could sound as a little bit strange question we work in all kind of industries paper car manufacturing furniture manufacturers uh, pharmaceutical makeups whatever uh we work in industry all across the spectrum but from the point of, of, of from the perspective we're talking about right now should we look at the food and agriculture with a slightly more attention at this moment uh or is it just my impression what do you think about that that's you know that's a direct and another di tough question but so i'm going to answer it in an equally direct way yes we have to pay more attention to it uh, whenever there's a crisis that's where we should be putting our emphasis on and that doesn't mean that we should forget other things i mean there's all of those other industries that you mentioned are equally important but this one really needs our attention today and we need to increase our focus in general i mean yes we can we have to we have to but not everybody knows what to do next and maybe that's something that you can shed some light on. Where do you start? How do uh, we begin? How do we begin? There's no starter's pistol. Yeah. So you know, you know my style very well. So I would just uh, expand it a little bit. Looking at any process, uh, I like to look at it as a battlefield. So, yes, you do. Because we do fight against defects, problems, unreliability, bad practice, all that stuff. So it's a battlefield. Mm -hmm. uh, and on the battlefield, there is always us, meaning people who protect the assets. Yep. And there are them, hundreds, sometimes thousands of failure modes trying to stop our assets. They're just like a small little devil sitting inside and looking for the way, you know, to stop this machine from working properly. So there is us and there's them always. Uh, in reality, uh, there's never enough of us. From the, from the perspective of the manpower in a typical typical setup of condition monitoring and reliability, I emphasize typical. Mm -hmm. And there is always more and more them. As machines are getting more complex, there is more and more possible failure modes. So we obviously need, need a clever approach because we are outnumbered very often. First, I would always start with us, creating a correct reliability culture and the right mindset. And us includes understanding assets, processes, goals, goals translation from the top to the bottom. And once I finish that, I would look at my enemy, get to know your enemy. This is, this is the key answer always. So understand mm -hmm. the failure modes, understand causes, symptoms, all of that. Understand your enemy and then try to start to fight. Well, now, now we need to start to fight and that's step number three. I will take out all available technologies, everything I can get my hands on. Uh, and I will choose carefully the ones that match the symptoms I'm looking for. Basically, it's same like a medicine. So if you share my view on the same sequence of action, now let me ask you to, to expand on those three steps. How do you see it? Well, it's an interesting perspective. You know, the, the, us, the us I can really wrap my head around because I know I can, you know, I can shake that person's hand and I can look that person in the eye. I know who us is. He's the condition monitoring guy. He's the reliability engineer that we, that we talk to and we see every day. But you did something a little bit different there when you started talking about them. <laughs> it's almost like you humanized them. You know, they're, they're not defects anymore. They're not symptoms of failure anymore. You call them little devils. And, and that put an image into my head, <laughs> almost yeah. like a, a Fred <laughs> Flintstone cartoon with the little devils <laughs> sitting on my shoulder, exactly. whispering in my ear. I want to flick that guy off and get rid of him for good. And so I think that's an interesting approach that you have to humanize the them, because it really clearly draws the battle lines, doesn't it? It's, it's, it, it engages it engages the guardians of our assets, you know, the condition monitoring team, the reliability team, then the maintenance guys that are going to fix things. But it puts a real face 
on the enemy. So I, I, I got to say, I like your approach. I, I, you know, I, I can def and that's a battlefield I definitely want to jump into with, uh, with both feet. Now, getting to know your enemy. Well, now that you've humanized them and you've made them a little devil, uh, I want to get to know them a lot deeper than just that because not every one of them is the same them. What do they say about pumps? How many different failure modes are there for a pump? 600 plus. If you, 600 if you plus. really want to be really, really pedantic, you can, you can put them in groups, but if you go individually, there are 600 plus devils sitting inside in every yeah. pump. And every one of those devils is producing friction. He's producing impacting. He's producing turbulence and cavitation. So we can start to learn to identify who that devil is by the noises he's making. Yes, exactly. exactly. So that's a, good, that's a good place for us to start building. But um, I think we have to do more than just address the them because there's lots of them there and we need to start looking more at the us because I mentioned at the beginning the reliability technician, the reliability engineer, the condition monitoring team, and, and maybe the mechanics that are making it. But you said there's not enough of them. And so we have to find more. We have to recruit yeah. more people. But how do you get people, how do you get people to join the, the, the army? How do you get, how do you recruit them in if the culture isn't there to, uh, to enable them or to empower them to feel like they should be involved in that? Well, that's, that's why and that's how we build culture. So mm -hmm. that's, that's the first thing. Uh, I, 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 like to, I like to call it a total involvement. So building a culture is, uh, is, is, is a process, is a difficult process. You know, any kind of culture you want to, you want to, want to build, starting from fan clubs of the certain basketball team uh, and, and you go all the way to, to any of the religions and, and anything, uh, uh, having this 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 uh, sociological phenomena it takes at least four elements so it's, we're talking about values beliefs behaviors and and uh, 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 rituals 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 uh, yeah. you cannot just have rituals and say i have a culture because rituals translated into industry are standard operating procedures so that's how yep. we do things but yep. just because you have this that's how we do things doesn't mean you have a people who understand, who share the values and everything. We just obey the orders. And that's usually not enough. So we need to build all four elements from top to bottom. The catch here is that you need to build culture top to bottom, but it can be destroyed both ways. So it's quite risky. It needs to be built and then it needs to be maintained continuously. And one of the key elements here is, is get people on board. Getting people on board means uh, uh, show respect to them, give them yeah. something, because there is always question, what's in it for me? And there must be something for him. Uh, education, improvement, respect, reward, uh, recognition, call it however you want. There are different styles. People can do it in different way, but, but there must be something for them in it. And the goals <laughs> needs to be translated. But That's just about every but it, but just about every organization I speak to comes back with the same problem that you identified. There's more of them than there is of us. So w this culture needs to expand beyond the reliability department. It, it needs to expand beyond the maintenance guys. It needs to encompass everybody. You say top to bottom, but you know the the receptionist who was hired by the company to to greet people as they as they visit visit the plant nothing in her job description said that she was responsible for a failed bearing or a compressed air leak but she is a member of reliability team in my in my opinion so what we call usually reliability team is a group of reliability leaders who need to make some plans some decisions some strategy no 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 they cannot execute reliability it's impossible. You cannot have five or six people to execute reliability in a, in a plant with 2,000 employees. That simply doesn't work that way. Everybody needs to be involved. So in my opinion, the reliability department is the company. 
The company is one big, happy reliability department. The, the, the problem is translating the goals. So if you say to the plant or uh, uh, the floor operator, or you say to the lady on the, on the, on the, on the, on the, on the gate, saying, uh, if you do it pro this way and properly, the company will have more profit. Well, let me use a little bit coarse language. I don't care about that. So what's in it for me? So what, we'll buy, we'll buy new, new, new cars? No, that doesn't change anything. What's my goal? So uh, uh, make, 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 a, make a, a, a slice up this plan into the more small individual plans and projects and give it to me, my project. Because mm. I don't like to work in your project, but if you make it my project, my micro project, I will be very happy to, to do it. Very happy to do it. I will take responsibility and hopefully I will take recognition as well. And then it makes sense. But I'd, I'd, like, to believe, I'd like to believe that there's more in it at the end of the day than just a paycheck. There's gotta be something good about going home at the end of the day and saying, hey, I actually made a difference. Mm -hmm. and, and it wasn't part of my job description, but I still made a difference. It could be something as silly as uh, spotting somebody doing, doing something in an unsafe way and reminding them, you know, reminding them to put their hearing protection on or to wear their, to wear their safety glasses because safety is also a big part of reliability. And, sure. and I, I don't remember a single plant that I've ever walked into where the receptionist or the person, that, the security guard that met me at the gate didn't make sure that I had the proper PPE. So they may have not even realized it, but in an indirect way, they were contributing to reliability just by making sure that I was safe. Yeah, so every, everybody is involved, whether, 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 we, whether, whether it's used in a proper way or not, but it's there, they're already involved. Now we just need to see how to make them the most useful for themselves and the company. Yeah, I told you my story about the janitor before. Yeah, it's a great one. It's you remember great, that I, one? I really, I really like it. It's, I think it's so appropriate to what we're talking about because the janitor, this particular janitor, he also ate reliability. <laughs> he made, you know, he, he empowered reliability and, and maybe it was just the culture at this particular company, but uh, he made it happen and he made it happen maybe quite by accident. But so this guy's job was to come in on the night shift. This plant ran two shifts on three, two shifts a day. And in the night shift, the, there was a team of people that came in and, and you know swept the floors, emptied the waste bins, and, and just prepared the uh, prepared the factory for starting the morning shift again. Mm -hmm. And this guy worked in a particularly quiet, remote part of the plant, but he was really familiar with it. And again, his job was he was pushing the broom, and he walked past a gearbox, and I don't know if it was a sixth sense or if he was using one of his God-given condition monitoring tools, but he felt something wasn't quite right. Mm -hmm. Again, his job is to clean the floor, not to do condition monitoring, but there's a vibration. There, there's, a, there's a natural vibration from the earth that connects us as, as one with nature. And there's also natural vibrations and resonations inside of our machines. And when we walk by them every day, we feel that. I know I can feel when my truck needs to be serviced. When I'm driving my truck, I can feel it in the steering wheel. Well, this janitor felt that that gearbox wasn't performing the way it's supposed to. Did he keep on pushing his broom because that was his job? No, he actually made a note of it. And then when the morning shift began and the maintenance, and the maintenance manager came in, he said, hey, you need to go down and check out this gearbox because something didn't quite feel right about it. As it turns out, they brought the vibration team down they took some measurements and they determined that the thing was just about on its last legs and ready to fail, but nobody would have caught it before the next da data collection interval. So here's a guy who could have just gone about his job, cleaning the floors and, and emptying the bins, but he went the extra mile. And that's because this particular organization already had that reliability culture installed. It's a, it's a great story and it shows the exact value of, of excellent high level reliability culture. We yeah. didn't even come to the point of any kind of technology, any kind of strategy, any kind of approach. What you explain here is something that is uh, called in industry ownership. 
So the guy took the ownership over everything that surrounds him uh, privately and personally. It's, it's, it's a human characteristic that we call care. He cares. So privately, he's a person who cares. And in industry, it shows up as, a, as an ownership over everything around you. Now, that means that the leadership in that particular company did a fantastic job because uh, you have to notice one fantastic thing here. Do we have to build a culture or we just have to let it back in? Uh, I always get funny questions when I say this, but the, the huge portion of that culture already exists. Nobody taught that guy to listen, to pay attention and to care about things. Nobody in that company, he was taught about that by his parents and grandparents. Uh, and he basically, he did exactly what he, he would have done at his home. Yeah. So you see, there is a culture. We don't need to invent it. Just let it back in the morning. My dear, my dear uh, friends, when you come to work, just bring your home culture to you with the work, to the work. And just, just do what you do home. You take care about your assets. You take care about your family. You are doing a zillion of tasks in your private life, because private life is a very complex asset management reliability yeah. phenomena. So yes. please just, just, just bring it in. And he did exactly that. And that's absolutely fantastic example of what we need to do. And, and what is it that we can do to make sure that other people don't take that reliability culture that they practice at home and just lock it in the boot of their car in, in the parking lot and come into the building and come in to start their shift? Show respect. No respect. <laughs> that's that's probably the most difficult difficult thing. That means show respect. Show respect to what those people already know. Show respect to the fact that they are coming every day to work, not just to rent away their, their time, but to bring their whole knowledge in. Talk a lot. Talking is a, is a, is a, is the most important part here. Yeah. And uh, it's actually a psychological approach. Now, what, what we see very often is that majority of the people involved in reliability are coming from the engineering world. Right. Uh, maybe majority, majority is a soft word, all of them. Now, how many times have you seen the member of the reliability team who is behaviorist, sociologist, psychologist, uh, some kind of experience in diplomacy? Don't say all of them because you know I, I, I'm not an engineer, I'm a history major. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. So that's, that, that's well, a good I'm, I'm the exception. Exactly. But, but the problem is that you are an exception. <laughs> that's the yeah. problem. That should be a yeah. standard way. Now, what, what do you get when you send an engineer to deal with all this stuff, to motivate people, to organize a team, to play diplomacy, to explain, to, to, to do this, this, this small human issues? What well, do you with get no to send engineer to do that. With no disrespect to all of the engineers that are probably watching this 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 presentation, <laughs> you don't get the result that you want. Absolutely. And what happens with the engineer himself who's trying to do that? He gets frustrated. Frustration. Because why are you are sending me to do a job that I'm not not trained to do? Yeah. That's not my. That's not. That shouldn't be my job. No. And that's, and, that's, and that's usually a mistake. But of course, you always have uh, enthusiasts, uh, people who really, really care enough that they say, I will do it anyway. And, mm -hmm. and, that's, and that's really fantastic. So building a culture is obviously, obviously a complicated first step because we are now talking still about the first step. But, but we, we are, can do it. And it's not, it's not a light switch. You don't flick it on. Culture, yeah. culture arrives bit by bit each day and you don't even notice it and then all of a sudden one day you show up at work and you go yeah there's a nice culture in this place i like working here yeah exactly but, but just, you said just you emphasize. said another thing you said another mm -hmm. thing about 10 15 minutes ago in our conversation you mentioned about availing ourselves of technologies yeah and and so that's great let's 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 assume that on our journey towards eating reliability, that we can build this amazing culture and recruit all a lot more us's to fight our little devil thems. How are we going to arm these people? 
what technologies you, you, you said avail them of all the technologies that they can that match the symptoms of the failures or the, the symptoms of the, the thems. I think that we should spend some time talking about that. Sure. So first of all, uh, there is a lot of things we have in our toolbox. So start with your nose, eyes, ears, uh, touch, and everything else. So that's also yep. technology. Everybody has a pair of sensors. So that's the first thing. Uh, but then you have so much technology that we are surrounded with right now. So but before we take the artillery out to the battlefield, we really need to understand what do we want to hit. Yep. So understanding the failure modes, understanding symptoms, playing doctor a little bit. Why mm -hmm. not? That's a good, that's a good approach. What am, I, what am I trying to find? How will this problem manifest itself in the stage one, two, three, four? Uh, and then saying, okay, those are my symptoms. How do I find them? Uh, the, same, the same like in medicine. There is a, there's really no, no difference. And then, and then, we, then we make our strategy. Uh, whatever it will be, we will go through our RCM and we'll say, okay, we'll, we'll do this on this kind of machine, we'll do this, we'll do that, to we'll finish that stuff. And then we say, uh, okay, now we are in the stage when we use technology. And now we are facing, facing two possible problems. Uh, we, do we have that technology? Yes, we have. Okay, excellent. Yeah. So money can buy that. Yeah. Then, then you have this option B, do we have enough people who care? Well, we built an excellent reliability culture. Great. So we have things that money can buy and money can't buy. Now we are in the battlefield. Now, how many infantry we have? How, we, how many foot soldiers we actually have? Who's going to use yeah. that? Who's going to use that technology? One thing that bothers you and bothers me a lot is that people have a piece of technology, call it an instrument, doesn't matter. It works for eight hours a day. For eight hours a day, it's on. Mm -hmm. in, in the best case scenario. And then for 16, the rest of the 16 hours is sitting on the shelf. Yeah. That's a pity. Now, yeah. the, why, why is it so? Because we don't have enough people to use this technology 24 hours a day. Mm -hmm. Or we do. Now, that's a question. Well, what do you think? I, I think that we're taking citizens and turning them into foot soldiers and some of the technologies that we talk about are very complicated, but not all of them. Exactly. And there are technologies out there that we can put into these, in, into these new recruits to make them highly effective uh, soldiers and, uh, and, we can, and we can teach them how to use these tools in a very short period of time, sometimes just 30, 45 minutes of instruction, and you can send somebody out with the right technology to do a single point task and come back with an outcome that deeply impacts reliability. Excellent. And this is, this is what we practically do. And this is why I feel so blessed that I'm with SDT team, because I have an opportunity to talk about that and to back it up, to back it up really and say, okay, yeah. you need to do that. And this is how you do that. So yeah. the catch is that if you look at the pyramid, we always have a very small number of, of top specialists, trained people. And I always ask, ask a very difficult question to these guys and girls. And I say, okay, you are highly trained in all these technologies. Can you answer honestly, how, what is the percentage of your total knowledge that you use every day? So guess the answer, please. Guess the answer because you, you, you see yourself in that situation asking that questions very often, I'm sure. Yeah, uh, I don't know. I've read statistics somewhere where we, where we deeply underuse our, our mental capacity. I, I've heard anywhere between 20 and 30% of our brain gets used and 70% of it gets wasted. Yeah, so, that, so, so now, now, now imagine this, all this investment, time, years yep. spent in training uh, experience and everything and then you use 15 to 20 this is the answer i usually get 15 to 20 percent of all that knowledge yeah it's a waste waste situation for everyone mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. everyone mm -hmm. and the main when i ask why the, the reason is always the same we don't have enough time time is one of the resources that management can control yeah. uh, the manager is the guy who's giving you the time to do the certain job so now you are top trained, you are highly, you are, you're, you're an expert, you're highly educated, do something for me. Yes, but give me time to do that. 
Because they don't. if I have to, yes, because if I had to run around from machine to machine, I don't have an opportunity to do everything. And you and you wonder, you wonder why these young engineers uh, that are coming in to work in the facilities don't want to go into reliability engineering. They want to go into some other some other element. To, but but we need people to come into condition monitoring and, and lubrication and all of these other uh, all of these other disciplines so we can fight for them. But the problem is is that they don't get the time. And I'm gonna give some advice to any young engineer that's out there right now. If you're in college or if you've just recently graduated college and maybe you're freshening up your resume and getting ready for an interview. Sometimes, the, I haven't been in a job interview in 30 years, but I can imagine, I haven't received one, I've given lots, but I can imagine um, sitting across the table from, from your, your future boss can be a bit of an intimidating uh, uh, ordeal, but I'm going to ask you to do something that takes you out of your comfort zone. And I want you to interview your boss. It might sound your future boss. It might sound crazy, but what's wrong with you saying to, to your future employer, if I come to work for you, if I bring my talents and my positive culture into your organization, are you going to give me the time that I need to make a difference? And if he even flinches or squirms or hesitates on the answer, I don't Go think on. that you need to wait for another phone call. You just move on to the next interview. Yes, exactly. But we have, and, and that's absolutely correct. And now we have so many people stuck in that situation saying, I have all this knowledge. I know what needs to be done. I know how I can improve it, but nobody listens to me. Uh, mm -hmm. that's, that's option one, option two. They, they do listen to me, but we don't have time. So, you know, Dr. House, the, 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 the hero, hero he, he's, he's a great guy, really, great TV show. Now, I used to love that how, show. Yeah, he's, he's doing some great things. Why? Because he has time to think and play, right? So he yeah. takes a case and then, and then, and then uh, uh, discuss it, talk about it and do everything. He has time. Now, imagine the same guy doing the general practice eight hours a day. How successful would, it, would he be? Not really, not really. No. You, you, you just waste the talent. So that's one of the problems. But so obviously our, our top, top engineers, they need some nurses. We need to distribute the task down the pyramid. But he had a great, because, on, on, the house, on, on that Dr. House uh, TV program, he had a great team. Yes, yes, he has, a, he has a great team. But now we have to take all these tasks that mm -hmm. are eating up the time of our top team and give them to somebody else yeah. for several reasons. So first of all, I would like to take 70% of those tasks down to the plant floor and tell to the person who is working on a machine, this is your responsibility now. But that makes perfect sense. Absolutely. Absolutely. That because that person is intimate with that machine. He or she knows that machine because they work with it every single day. Yes. We're talking about we're talking about operators here. I mean, somebody is exactly. operating a machine, just like the janitor that that found the bad gearbox. He's around that machine every single night. Well, the operator is beside that machine every single day, and there's a vibration, there's a connection, and that connection is, you might if if you don't believe me, it's real. There's a connection mm -hmm. there. Now, if we can put some simple technology into that operator's hands. Mm -hmm. what, mag what magic could they bring for us? That they can be, bring huge benefit, unmeasurable benefit from, this, from the different perspectives. So first of all, uh, there is a huge percentage of the binary defects. So it's simple right. yes or no. Something leaks, something is, 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 is touching each other as a metal to metal contact, something is, yep. sounds, sounds funny. So there are a lot of binary defects. And there's no better person to find it than the guy who is all around all day. So just imagine taking that task from the top of the pyramid down there. So first of all, you free, you free time of, of, of your top engineers, but then you, have, then you have something else. You have the whole army of condition monitoring, who's actually operations, but now they're also condition monitoring, who are monitoring the machine and finding the problem in early stage. They're also collecting the data. The, yeah. the real valuable condition monitoring data for the, for the guys upstairs. Then you have another effect. 
Another effect is that you actually showing a huge respect and you are, you, you are, you are, you are, you are, you are, you're getting in return a huge loyalty because you come to the plant floor operator and say, I want to give you a training. Respect and loyalty him. builds culture. Exactly. So you tell him, I'm going to give you a training. You know, these guys with headphones walking around, they look very smart and very important. I want they you have, to be one of them. I want have, you to be. They have technology in their hands. Yeah. I want you to be one of them. Now, I, open, open all doors. You want to be yep. Cat 75, go there. But don't, in, don't, don't scare him. Tell me how much training you want. Would you like to do aerobics? Why not? Would you like to do a little bit of steam traps? Why not? Would you like to touch the bearing and collect the data? Well, yes, I would like to do that. Okay, give him the training he's, he wants. And that shows a huge respect. What you get in return is golden nugget. Yep. Because now you have people who are competent and capable of doing the job, who care, who are building the culture, and you have a lot of time for your top operators. So mm -hmm. one of the blessings we have in, in ultrasound is the possibility that you have the same instrument, those two babies you have on your table, those, those two instruments can be used by a top engineer to, to analyze the data coming from the planetary gearbox, which is never easy. Yeah. But the same instrument in night shift can be used by somebody to find a very simple airlift. Yeah. Same technology. And you asked me different. You people. asked me at the, earlier in the conversation. You asked me about my plate of food and what I see and, and, and what I think about the high prices at the grocery store. And I don't know if you remember. I'm sure you do. The first thing I mentioned off was all of those binary defects that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. The air leaks, the steam trap, the steam leaks. You know these little these little processes these little process um, defects that can be found and fixed on the spot. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Before With before this. before they generate bigger damage. Yeah, even yeah. before that. So, but go yeah. but but we have to move beyond binary. It's not just binary defects that are uh, that are impacting reliability. Mm -hmm. Yes, so if we, if, we, if we put all the binary tasks down there at the, bot, at, at, at the foundation of the pyramid, mm -hmm. and then you move up through your team, and then you say, okay, now I have my lubrication people. Yeah. They are not all the way up, but they are not all the way down. What do we do with them? They should be all the way up. Yes, well, connect, connect them with condition monitoring team because they mm -hmm. visit machine every day. As a matter of fact, let's be completely honest, condition monitoring people is a bunch of nice guys with a lot of technology, putting sensors and observing. We don't do anything. We don't, we don't do anything to machine. We have, we have no intimate interaction with the machine. We can do right. no harm. So we are, we are just a bunch of people who are watching what's going on. Yeah. We are observing the situation. And there is a guy who actually creates the situation who has a most intimate, intimate uh, relationship with the machine, that's a grease guy, who's put, yep. putting the grease inside. So now we can employ them and, and join them to condition monitoring and saying, hey, while you are lubricating that, first of all, let's lubricate it properly. Second of all, why don't you collect the data at the same time? And you will be my second, second barrage, second level of defense. And yeah. then you, find, you, you suddenly find yourself in a situation that you have your top team with all the time in the world to do root cause analysis, recommendation for improvement, actually using their knowledge completely. It's a win-win combination. Right, but, but in the organizations that I visit, that I speak to on a regular basis that don't have this reliability culture, that lube guy is never going to be joined with condition monitoring because he's not a lube guy, he's a grease monkey. Yes. So and, the, uh, the respect yeah. is missing. Yes. Yes, I agree. And there is, a, there is a huge job to be done. And we are doing it for, for years already. And uh, the, the metamorpho metamorphosis I have seen, the transformations I have seen, and you as well, all of us, is from Grease Monkey to Mr. Grease Guy in three days is, is something fantastic. It's a feeling that money can buy. Yeah. Definitely. Because you see a person coming from the end of the food chain after three, four days of training and a little bit of awareness from his bosses becomes Mr. Grease guy. The Empowered. guy who walks like this, who walks with a, with a back straight, proud of the job he's doing. So, yep. And there's a, lot, there's a lot more job to be done, of course. There'll be a lot more talking and talking and talking 
but it brings huge results. And now, now we set up this pyramid properly. And, and luckily we have a management who says, I'm ready to invest in, my, in, my, uh, in, in the technology and training. We mm -hmm. built reliability culture. And, uh, and now we come to the, to the harsh uh, capitalist reality. You mentioned that in the beginning, so I'm just continuing it. Sure. Now, now your boss come to you and say, Alan, what can you do for me now? Show me the money. Show I me just, the money. I just spent uh, X, Y, Z money on instruments. I yep. had five people on a training for three days and I paid for that on top of that. So uh, I'm a little bit impatient. Yeah. And please don't tell me about some, some, some reliability improvement in four years. I trust you. I know that will happen. What can you bring me next week? What and that's, and that's the now? reality. Uh, that's the reality that I've come to learn in talking with the bosses, exactly. with, with the senior executives. If you want to get the attention of a senior executive, you have somewhere between five and seven minutes to, to, get his, to, have, to, to hold his attention. If you're lucky enough to capture his attention, you've got between five to seven minutes and you have a very simple, a very simple um, process to follow. Only two questions. What is it? And how is it going to make my life better? So do not bore him with how it works because he doesn't care. Don't bore him with the inner workings of the technology. None of that matters. What is it? How is it going to make my life better? And know that you're going to lose his attention in seven minutes. And you're definitely going to lose his attention if you tell him, well, in six months to a year, I'm going to come back with a, with, with a, a spreadsheet that shows you all the bearings that didn't fail. And, and I'll, so give me 12 months and I'll come back with a, you know, a report on how much, how much money we saved with this reliability initiative. No, that's where we come back to those quick hitters, those binary defects that you spoke about a few minutes ago because those are quick wins. It's the low hanging fruit. We can go out and we can pick it. We can chart it, we can calculate it and we can go there. That's how much I'm gonna save you. And if you give me the time, I'm gonna save you that money in the first week, maybe the first month. Yeah, so we can, so we can This becomes it. free. <laughs> this is yeah, free so after we, that first month. So we can divide it in those, those free, free beautiful steps that we see every day. So the first step is show me the money. Show me something now. Yeah. It doesn't need to be millions. Just show me something now. So I can put it in a report and say, hey, this was a great investment. Let's, mm -hmm. let's, let's work on it further. So that's the low hanging fruit. It's, it, it's not a huge amount of money. It's a serious amount of money, but we're not talking about millions. But it can be done next week. And then we move to the next part saying, okay, let's, let's now improve, uh, improve the, the, the reliability. Let's find the problems on time. Let's save some, some operating time. And that's gonna be a result that will show in six months to one year and from that point on, and we are talking about very serious money. But, but I'm, step I'm, gonna stop, I'm gonna stop you there because I disagree. Mm -hmm. I, I, can, I can give you a list of binary defects that I've helped customers find that have, in a, that have in fact translated into millions of dollars. So binary defects can relate into much bigger savings than, than just the energy costs from, a, from mm -hmm. a fixed air leak or, or a replaced steam trap. You know, I've come across um, air leaks on packaging lines that threaten production, stop production. And I'll tell, mm -hmm. you, I'll tell you another story. Uh, I was visiting uh, a company here in Toronto here, Toronto, Canada, and uh, they make uh, fiberglass insulation, which we put in the attic of our house and in the walls of our house to keep us warm in the, in the winter and, and keep the air conditioning in in the, in the summertime. And just a simple conveyor and, and uh, fiberglass insulation goes into the plastic and then this pneumatic air valve, all it was was a diverter. And it just, it, the job of that air valve was to decide if the package was going to go this way or this way. So basically just a, an air, a pneumatic cylinder open and close. And I'm walking the plant floor with my 270 and my headphones on. And I see around the seal of that pneumatic cylinder, I hear air leaking from it. 
touch my customer. I said, he listened to this one and he listens to it and he goes, that's 45 PSI. That doesn't cost anything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not worth stopping the production to, uh, to replace that cylinder. I got to go order one. We probably don't have one in spares. Maybe we might have one, but I don't know. Uh, I'm going to have to take the production down for at least three hours or at least an hour or two to, to change it out. Fair enough. We move on. I called them back a week later and that pneumatic seal, it blew out and they were down for the entire day because they couldn't, they didn't have a spare part and they couldn't find it locally. And so and that's a lot that was of the cost. That was, that was a lot more cost than just a, a few hundred dollars in, in energy waste. Exactly. So that, that's, that's the beautiful part. You have this show me the money moment that mm. can happen in a, in a best case scenario during the, during the demo or during the training itself, which yep. is very often, we know, we yep. know that. And that's why we like trainings. And, yep. or it can happen by the team itself within a week or two. That's mm -hmm. the beautiful show me the money problem. Now we go to the second stage saying, okay, how do I improve reliability? How much Stop money does it, does it bring? That top brings, of the pyramid yeah so that brings millions improving reliability brings millions it doesn't happen overnight because when you start with your condition monitoring you'll be slowly finding problems finding them on time replacing your reactive to your predictive and proactive activities mm -hmm. and and then after a year or two you will see enormous difference enormous now of course for those inpatient people we have show me the money moment so here, right. here's your show me the money. Now let me do my job. And then you have enough time. Nobody's sitting on your back and looking over your shoulder. You have enough time to build it. Now, what do you do here? You, 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 you practically increase uptime. You remove a lot of maintenance activities, especially reactive ones. By that, you, you improve, improve safety. You reduce the number of spare parts simply because you're finding things on time and actually you are removing problems very often. And that's, that's where, we, where we usually need to focus for the, for the big, long-lasting, long-term results. Mm -hmm. And in combination of technologies, this combination of technologies brings a huge, huge possibilities. Now, how does it look like when, 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 you, when you face something that I want to mention here, especially because I'm sure that in the audience, there are a lot of, lot of condition monitoring people in the audience. Uh, there, there, is a, there is a moment of frustration. There is a, oh my God moment. When you find a problem and you act as a, as, a, as a diagnostic expert, so you find a problem and you are completely aware how problem is serious and you come wagging your tail, you are happy as a baby because you say, yeah, I got it, I found it. Mm -hmm. And then you come to the people and say, hey, that bearing is failing. Let's do something about that. And then you have very calm faces from the other side and they say, so what? So and what? It's, it's a shocking moment. What do you mean, so what? Yeah. They say it's a it's, it's hundred, hundred bucks bearings. It's a hundred, hundred, hundred dollar bearing. Yes, but, and you don't even have time to explain because they say it's a one hundred dollar bearing. So why do you want to find a solution when there's no problem? It's a source of a huge frustration. And, uh, and, uh, and the root cause of that is that people fail to calculate the real uh, defect cost. What is the cost of the failure? Yeah. There are a zillion of elements inside. Bearing yeah. is none of them. Oh, no. I mean, you have, you, you, have to pay, you have to pay somebody to repair it. And while, you're, and while that person's repairing it, you're not making anything. Yeah. So you have a downtime, you have, you have a, a people coming to the overtime, they are doing it in a rush, they never do it properly when it's, when it, when it's an urgent job. So you that's, don't a, have safety, a, spare that's part. a safety risk now because people are working under stress. Exactly. You are not producing anything. Now, just imagine if you fail to deliver and then, and then you pay the penalties to your, to your, uh, uh, to your client. Next time you sign a contract, there's going to be a different, different tone in negotiation, definitely. Maybe there won't be a next time. Exactly. Now, imagine about all the collateral damage that if you stop the problem in the very beginning, that's just a problem. That's just one devil. But if, the, if, if there's some other devil joined the party, 
and then you have a lot of collateral damage. Now we're not talking about 100 bucks anymore. But the problem is that every condition monitoring needs to be a little bit of diplomatic guy and to play the game and saying why my boss doesn't know the real cost of the failure. It's usually a small time politics. You, you know what the condition monitoring team needs is they need a salesman. Somebody who, yes. somebody who can sell the problem. <laughs> I agree. Yeah. <laughs> because the, uh, very often that information about huge cost of problem doesn't, doesn't go up all the way. Because I protect you, you protect me. Don't tell everybody. Come on, let's 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 keep it. Let's keep it low. Uh, but I, ha I had a, I had a situation when when the one hundred bearing uh, uh, one hundred dollar bearing had failed uh, mm -hmm. was not one hundred dollar one hundred dollar uh, failure cost. It was one hundred and fifty thousand dollar failure cost, and that's that's common. I didn't find anything unusual. That's the usual situation. But the difference is just that we speak out this time. We, we, we didn't keep silent. That's the only difference. That's what happens every time. So, and then, and then at, at a, as a stage three, after show me the money, after improving, improving our practices completely, we come to the stage three. And stage three is, let's improve it now. Let's make it even better that it was, it was designed in the first place. And that's the beautiful part because in reliability, we are doing two things. We are finding the problem we know about, but then we need to know, find improvements that nobody has any idea how they look like. So let's not just injure the devil. Let's kick them right out of the plant. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So when we, when we know, when we, when we talk about our eight pillars of ultrasound, yeah. these are eight applications that we, that we cover there are eight areas where ultrasound can be used. So it's a huge area. It's really huge. It covers practically entire plant. And let's not forget that we also have pillars, people, that with this technology, everyone can use it. So you have right. eight pillars sitting on hundreds of pillars. It's those eight pillars that are supporting the entire facility that are holding. And, and I always like to say that those eight pillars of ultrasound are the pillars that hold up the roof. And the roof is the reliability and it's the reliability that keeps the weather from coming in and, and, and destroying things. And yeah. so let's talk about those eight pillars, Harris, uh, because you know there's probably a lot of people listening in on this conversation that have no idea what we're talking about. Yeah, so we, we, we tried to talk about that several times, trying to find the criteria, criteria of the sequence. How do we talk about that? Do we, go, do we go by criteria of value? Do we go by criteria of simplicity? And every well, time we have a problem, right? We, we, but, we never get but it I, right. <laughs> but I think, I think if we want to stay in harmony with this conversation and, and you know, going back to the whole us versus them and recruiting our foot soldiers, well, mm -hmm. what was the what was one of our biggest concerns was uh, overwhelming those foot soldiers <laughs> with things that are too complicated or things that they would require years of uh, of training to become competent. So why don't we why don't we explain these eight pillars in terms of simplicity of uh, execution? Okay, so let's start from there. Okay, let me let me ask you again. So you have your babies uh, sitting on your table right there. And uh, yeah, keep them, keep them warm. Mm -hmm. And uh, what can you do with absolutely zero human resources in a few days? What change can you make? What tasks can you give them and train them to do them properly? Well, if, we're, if I'm going to come to an operator, I'm going to create a list of single point tasks for him that he can address specifically for his machine. And that could be something as simple as to, at the beginning and or the end of the shift, going around the entire machine and finding if there's any compressed air leaks. And while he's at it, vacuum leaks as well, if that's, if that's, uh, if that's applicable. And why would I ask him to do that every single shift? Because leaks happen. They, they don't mm -hmm. just happen once you fix them and they go away. Uh, 
you have to you have to be vigilantly going after those. So, uh, in a small work cell, you could probably do a complete compressed air leak scan in less than five minutes every single day, and right. and move on. And and the energy savings from that are going to be significant over time. But also, as I explained earlier, with my pneumatic uh, cylinder, maybe you're going to find a problem that's going to prevent whoever's coming in on the shift after you from operating that machine. And so you could be preventing some downtime. So compressed air leaks, uh, why, not, uh, why not check some steam traps? Because steam traps are not that difficult. We can try can train somebody to listen to a steam trap in, in less than 20 minutes. And uh, while, it, while he's at it, uh, you know, a steam trap is just a valve with an IQ of one. So why don't we train them to also check to see if uh, process valves that are supposed to be closed are actually closed. Uh, mm -hmm. We could go a little bit deeper and even teach him a little bit about how a valve works. And maybe he can start listening inside the valve to see if, uh, if um, you know, if it's a pneumatically actuated valve, maybe we can teach him to find an internal uh, pressure or vacuum leak that, that's affecting the actuation of that valve. So leaks, steam traps, uh, hydraulics, uh, sorry, valves. I said hydraulics, so now the cat's out of the bag. We, why don't we teach them to do some troubleshooting on the hydraulics if that's applicable to that to that machine as well? So there, those four of the eight pillars, and I think that those ones can be handed off to an operator as single point tasks with very mm -hmm. minimal instruction and huge outcomes, immediate outcomes. I agree. I agree definitely with that. Why don't we throw tightness in as well? Because... Well, I want my avocados to arrive in Canada fresh. So. <laughs> exactly. I mean, who's who's the who's better person to check the tightness of the truck of the, of the, of the uh, cold truck that is bringing your avocados than the driver himself? Yeah. Well, that's a job he can do it quite easily if the union lets him. Then you have people in the you know plant. the driver the driver is responsible if he's carrying a load that needs to be tied down. The res the the driver is responsible to make sure it's strapped down tight. Absolutely. Why not check the tightness too? Yeah, so the, the, the refrigerators in a big, big food processing plant, they consume mm -hmm. a lot of energy. There are a lot of people around those refrigerators who open them up, close them down, unloading, loading. They are the best person to do that. You don't need your condition monitoring to do that either because these guys understand it much, much better. I'm absolutely sure. So we actually have five of them that we can throw into the complete operator driven reliability. Am I right? 100%, 100% right. Okay. Yep. Then we have one, 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 uh, one area, which is electrical. Okay. Electrical that, uh, that we have to look through, through different lenses sometimes. Yep. Uh, it's, it's quite straightforward. It's quite simple. Uh, you can be- But it makes people nervous fast. though. Exactly. Electricity makes people nervous. Yeah, yeah. But, well, it makes me nervous. Yeah. <laughs> But but again, we, we also need to we also need to respect the fact that in many in many companies there are strict rules who yeah. is who is authorized to do this kind this kind of uh, of inspection. So sometimes it can, sometimes it can be operated with reliability, yeah. uh, not from uh, from the from the perspective of simplicity. It can be always, but sometimes we need to follow the rules. So electrical is one of them. Because mm -hmm. as, as I know, you said many times, uh, and, I, and I, I couldn't agree with that more, that uh, all rotating machinery stops when there is no power. <laughs> so it's, so if, if you want to look at the rotating machinery, start from the beginning. There must be a transformer sending electricity to that electrical motor. So highly important. So what do we have left? That's, that's six, right? Uh, we got leaks. So we've done leaks. We've done steam traps, valves, hydraulics, tightness. We touched on electricity now. So lubrication and mechanical. Okay, lubrication and, is not important. Let's just, let's just jump to, to mechanical. Uh, leave that to the grease monkeys, right? Yes, lubrication is not important. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, uh, lubrication, lubrication definitely. Uh, so we are both obsessed with lubrication excellence. And we had to find a way to keep our mouth shut because this recording, this presentation and, and, and chit chat will go for, for next eight hours. That's yeah. quite difficult, <laughs> difficult to control. 
Yep. But it's definitely it's definitely uh, a proactive proactive uh, area. Definitely, there is nothing predicted. There's not nothing reactive in in, in lubrication. At least it shouldn't well, be. It's a proactive and, and, area. And when and when we've asked we ask this question all the time. I know I know that uh, I've listened to you present and you've listened to me present on this topic, and we always start the presentation with the same question. Name the one thing that can disable or enable reliability the fastest. And just about everybody in the room is always going to say lubrication. Uh, yeah. And you know, you know what, I, what, I, what I used to say, give me 10 minutes, look out of the way, give me a grease gun and I will destroy 10 electrical motors. Yeah. The good thing is that they will not stop immediately right now. They will give me a time to be far enough so you cannot kill me. <laughs> But that's what your grease guy can do every day. And that's what happens every day. Yeah. And now we can, we can look at it from, the two, from two perspectives. First of all is, is as a proactive task, which is incredibly important, incredibly important. Uh, it can be done right and it should be done right because it eliminates the problem. Uh, you know, finding problem in early stage is a good news once, but if you come every week and saying, I found a problem in early stage. I found a problem in early stage. Okay, enough. Now it's not the good news anymore. Yeah. Definitely. Well, make the problem go away. Stop finding it. What's the reason? Remove it. And we know that 60 to 80% of those problems are caused by poor lubrication practice. So we can look at it from that perspective. But then again, we look from the perspective who can do it. Uh, any loop technician who is given enough professional and correct training and enough time to do the job will do it as at the highest possible level. The time to do the job, again, that creeps into the scenario because we've got too Absolutely. many managers that are saying, how come it's taking you so long to grease 100 bearings? Can't you do that faster? No, because I'm doing it right. There you go. <laughs> so you can do it right or you will do it again. Yeah, <laughs> very, very, very soon. As so the old, I, as the old adage says, if if you haven't got time to do it right the first time, you're never going to have time to fix it. Yeah, certainly. So we had this this beautiful situation with lubrication that is, when you start, it's it's a huge problem, a black hole of your reliability. But that's that's the area I like because with one move you actually improve 60, 70 percent. Mm -hmm. And why, why, why would I do anything else be before I fix that? Yeah. And it can be done. It can be done by people that are already there. You just a little bit longer, a little bit longer competency curve than say going out and finding Certainly. a leak or listening to a steam trap. I mean, Certainly. Certainly. And, and maybe, but... and maybe your criteria for selecting the people to do that task needs to be a little bit more scrutinized as well. Wouldn't you agree? I agree. I agree definitely because there are that uh, I see only two groups of people. <laughs> you know, I, I I don't I don't look at them by their competences because the competence is what we will give them during the training. That's not a problem. There are only two groups I see at the trainings: masters and wanters. I know very well how good your English is, and I know how many times you told me that masters and wanters doesn't exist in the English language. But sorry, I cannot resist. The, I know the, what want, the wanters are people who really want to get trained, who want yeah. to improve, who want to be a uh, uh, top, top class in their work. Masters are people who just must be at the training. The boss told them, be there and listen. You can immediately see the face. So, so when you say we need to scrutinize it a little bit, yeah, I agree. Remove the masters, keep the wanters. Keep the people yeah. who want. Those who are, who, are, who are ordered to be there, they will never do a good job anyway. Anyway, they will yeah. just resist this way or another. So and sometimes it's is, nice if you can just ask them to leave, but it's not always possible. Yeah, yeah, I agree, I agree. So we removed binary issues. Uh, yeah. If we remove if we remove lubrication as a root cause from the proactive area, so what do we have left? Now we Mechanical. have- uh, yeah, now we have the mechanical condition monitoring. So if yeah. you do everything in your power to remove the causes, now what you can do is vigilantly look, monitor, and if 
if some of the devils wakes up, then you will be able to find it on time. So what can we do in mechanical oven? Oof. Well, the first thing, the first thing um, most condition monitoring reliability people are going to think of when we say mechanical is it's got to be rotating. It's not really true unless you're just focused on vibration analysis. But when you start to focus on performing mechanical condition monitoring with ultrasound, it doesn't need to necessarily be rotating. All it needs to be, all it needs to do, all the defect symptoms needs to produce is friction or impacting or turbulence. And when you have those three uh, elements, then you know that you can go out and hunt down those defects. So for sure, for sure, for sure, for sure, when we talk about mechanical, we are thinking about bearings, we're thinking about couplings, we're thinking about gearboxes and all of those things I will concede, do go around in circles, except for the ones that just do this, mm -hmm. or just do this. <laughs> or they're not going around in circles, but they're still. <laughs> white. We won't do any. We won't do any white man dancing. Um, but but the the point is is that whether it's going around in a circle, whether it's actuating back and forth or sliding in an axis. It's got the ability to produce friction and impacting, and we can measure those things. We can detect them, and we can use that data to plan and act so that we can repair and resolve. Um, there's other elements that we think about. The other thing that we think about when it comes to mechanical is, well, if it's mechanical, I must have to put my probe on it. I must have to touch it. And that's true with a bearing and that's true with a gearbox and, and so many of the things we check. But we also know that ultrasound as a technology works beautifully when you detect things that are airborne and um, a misaligned coupling or a poorly lubricated coupling or uh, a poorly maintained chain drive, um, belts. misaligned belts, bel belts that haven't been tightened properly. All of these mechanical uh, functions, these mechanical processes produce friction and impacting and turbulence that's generated through the air. And the only way to detect them is with an airborne sensor, not a contact sensor. Mm -hmm. um, we, have, we have had great success at some of the paper companies, the paper machine companies that we work at um, using the 340 with a flexible sensor and capturing a time waveform and a spectrum off of a, off of a flexible coupling. And all we do is we put the, uh, the flexible sensor through a small access hole in the coupling guard. So we don't expose the, uh, the condition monitoring technician to any risk whatsoever, any safety risk. And he can listen to the coupling, take a 15 second, a 20 second, or he can take a 10 minute, second, a 10 minute sample if he wants to. And then look at that coupling in the time waveform. And we can very quickly see if that coupling is wearing. And we can also, by looking in the spectrum, see if there's misalignment. So, you know, I can, I can talk for eight more hours if you want about mechanical applications. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, the point is friction impacting and turbulence, if it's moving, is going to produce it. And, and we can find all those little devils that are running around. Yeah, what we have a great possibility is... Uh is uh, uh, extreme precision of uh, especially baby left left breath from you uh, that gives huge opportunity to find these small impacts in the early stage that will reveal that the problem is in development stage. And also I, I need to mention this as a subcategory of mechanical, the older I get, the lower speed I enjoy. So the low oh, yeah. speed, the low speed machinery is 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 a uh, is always a problem. Usually a problem. Uh, we find it as a, as a very very nice and easy job with a tra with enough training, with enough understanding how to do the job properly. But ultrasound gives a huge opportunity to deal with low speed machinery, and that is very very often a pain point. And, and food production that. facilities, slow speed is ubiquitous. Yeah. So, so there is a there is a lot of applications where this can be used and a problem resolved, because mm -hmm. there is always a solution for the problem. We just need to we just need to find it. We just our our our, our paths needs to cross, and then problems problems will be resolved. 
when, when we talk about these eight pillars of ultrasound, well, there's not just eight things that we can do with ultrasound. There's eight categories of things that we can do with oh, ultrasound, yes. but like just take mechanical. You know, I mentioned mechanical, or you mentioned mechanical and asked me to speak on it. And I, and I, you know, without even thinking, came up with about 10 different really easy, quick hitting applications. Mm -hmm. The same with, you know, the, the same with, uh, you know, with valves. It's not just a matter of whether the valve is passing or not, but the actual inner workings of that valve. So each of these eight application pillars branches us into defects that, that, are, that are far beyond just the singular pillar. Yeah, the, the machines, are, machines are more and more complex and even simple machines are not so simple as, the, as they look and there are, there are many elements, not all of them rotate. There are also, also the, 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 for, for instance, take, take for example, the, 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 the big uh, reciprocating compressor. So mm -hmm. there are valves on the reciprocating comp compressor. Yep. So uh, the valves are not, not, not part of the mechanical inspection, but they are critically important because they're integral part. So when we look at this way, we need 10, 15 hours just to make a list and then to start discussing it, discussing it well. So first of all, before, before we continue, let's make a date for another discussion and then, then talk about pillar by pillar and then branch them down to the, to the details. Before, before we do that, I just want, I want, to, I want to go back. I want to rewind to tightness because I completely forgot to mention in context with this audience, which is around food and agriculture, mm -hmm. um, th there's a huge opportunity to improve the working environment, the safety and the health of the guy driving the combine. Exactly. And um, there's, a, there's a few companies, uh, in, uh, the, there's located in Europe, there's another one in Brazil, and there's one here in Canada, and they're all making, they're all manufacturing those enclosures or those cabins that, uh, that make it possible to sit in a combine for 8, 10, 12 hours a day in the heat, in the dust, etc. cetera. And um, tightness is a great application for making sure that the inner environment that inner working environment of the operator of that, of that huge machine is not just comfortable, but safe, you know, safe from sure. dust and, and so on. So uh, when you talk about tightness, don't talk about, just think about refrigeration, think about the comfort and the safety of the operator of the machine. Yes, Sorry. Uh, there's a huge, oh, you're absolutely right. There's a huge number of applications and you know, there's ne never enough of us, but there's also never enough time. Because yeah. I, I know you and me and our discussions, we can go for hours like this. And, and we already have. <laughs> yeah, it's always interesting. And I hope it's always, it's always useful. So it's very, it's very difficult to finish this with a conclusion. But uh, we answer that we do eat reliability. We can eat reliability. Uh, I can only, from my side, I can only say that uh, uh, ultrasound has evolved dramatically. In, in, in last year's dramatic evol uh, uh, yeah. evolution. And um, there are a lot of problems out there that solutions already exist. So let's just cross the path, join the future and, and do it together. So Mr. Nice Guy, Mr. Nice Guys, I will now, now let you conclude this, this chit chat. Well, I can't say more other than Yes, I agree with you. We can eat reliability. We can implement all of these great ideas that we spoke about today to improve reliability and therefore lower our food costs, make, uh, make food more accessible to the, uh, to the people that are, that are not getting enough food or that don't have access to it. And, uh, and, and so I just say, let's hear more. Let's, let's continue this conversation uh, in another week or two and see where else we can go with it because I really do believe by not taking that plate of food for granted and, um, and projecting that into the reliability culture and concepts of thinking, we can, we can make a difference in that. And, and it's an important place to make a difference because without nourishment, it's a miserable, miserable planet to live on. Let's make it better. Agreed. Hey, okay. it's lunchtime in 30 minutes. Again? <laughs> so you eat every day. That's a very nasty, nasty Canadian habit. 
I'm fortunate and I'm, and I'm grateful. Okay. Until and the I'm next grateful to have a conversation like this with you, my friend. It was my pleasure. Absolutely. Right. So until the next opportunity. Take care. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.